Good morning, everybody. It's really uh, delightful to get to speak to you today about some of the work that uh, my lab is conducting. We are studying schizophrenia, which as you just heard from uh, Dr. Fisher, is a really devastating disorder uh, that ultimately can impact around 1% of young people. Um, and it's a disease where uh, we have some treatments for some of the symptoms, but unfortunately no cure and no real means of preventing the illness. Uh, our group is studying um, the potential for folic acid, uh, which is a B vitamin that's found in the diet and in uh, fortified grain products, uh, not only as a potential treatment for schizophrenia, but hopefully as a, a means to prevention. And I'll tell you a bit about our, our work. So even though schizophrenia tends to emerge in the second or third decade of life, uh, for a long time, we've thought of it as a, a really a neurodevelopmental disorder where something is going awry, perhaps as early as in utero, uh, and it's only later in life that the full uh, syndrome manifests itself. Um, uh, there's convergent evidence to suggest that abnormal uh, metabolism of folic acid may play some role uh, in risk for developing schizophrenia. A lot of this comes from uh, large epidemiologic studies that have looked at uh, incidents of schizophrenia 20 years after famine where uh, because the mother was exposed to famine conditions, again, something happens with the development of the child and ultimately uh, they have about a two times higher risk of develop developing schizophrenia. Um, interestingly, there's some analogous work looking at autism, uh, which uh, shares some features with schizophrenia where, um, uh, again, exposure to uh, folic acid in utero may be uh, protective, actually, by a factor of two. Um, we spent the last few years looking at, at people, once they have schizophrenia, at whether uh, giving folic acid back as a supplement to their antipsychotic medications may have some effect. And we do see some modest benefit for people who already have schizophrenia. But as you can see, that this red arrow is uh, somewhat smaller uh, than the one from um, prenatally, probably reflecting the fact that at that point, some of the damage has been done, uh, and it may not be possible for uh, giving supplemental folic acid to completely um, restore uh, the brain. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, by the same token, the idea of intervening early on, uh, potentially, again, in utero, uh, there may be a stronger uh, protective effect than even uh, giving folic acid-based supplements when people have already expressed the, the disease. So what I'm doing with the MQ project uh, is uh, basically leveraging a, a large-scale public health uh, intervention, which was the introduction of folic acid fortification of grain products. Uh, and this was something that happened in the United States uh, in the late 1990s. The, the reason it's a shortcut is because to study the relationship between something that happens during gestation and a, a disease that really fully manifests 20 years later is very difficult to do for, for obvious reasons. Um, by looking at this intervention, though, we can get a sense of whether the rollout of folate fortification affected the brain um, uh, in ways that may be relevant to schizophrenia to give us some hint of uh, if uh, you know, we see uh, changes in brain structure and function in individuals who are exposed to the intervention that, that could herald a protective effect ultimately for schizophrenia risk. And this is one example. This is a pilot data that we have generated from a large cohort of children who received MRI scans uh, of the brain at Massachusetts General Hospital. And what we're finding is that for children who were born later on in the, the period where folate fortification was introduced, they tend to have a thicker cerebral cortex in a part of the brain that is very relevant for schizophrenia. This is another study that was done uh, at the National Institute of Mental Health looking at, uh, again, children, uh, we heard a bit about this from Dr. Fisher, um, who have a, a sibling uh, with a psychotic disorder. So these are children who don't have schizophrenia, but they have high genetic loading for it, and comparing their brains to those of children who don't have an affected relative. And what we see is in this same part of the brain called the inferior uh, frontal cortex, um, there's again this thinning, uh, potentially as a marker for genetic loading for schizophrenia. And that's the very part of the brain that we're seeing in our preliminary data that seems to have some uh, effect of fortification. Um, so going forward, what we'll be doing over the next few years is looking at a larger cohort of uh, the Mass General Sample, but also looking prospectively um, both at a healthy adolescents and at those who uh, have a first-degree relative with psychosis. And the question is really, um, will we see a reduction in difference between those groups as a function of birth date, where those who were born later during the full-out uh, full uh, rollout period uh, seem to have uh, more favorable um, brain imaging profiles. And we're also collaborating uh, 
uh, now with a new collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania. It's a large cohort, uh, epidemiologic cohort, looking at youth in the Philadelphia area. And this will give us an opportunity to uh, potentially replicate and expand on our findings. And looking at this in a bunch of ways, uh, the cortex of the, of the, the, the thickness of the cortex is really just one way. We're also looking at activation of the brain during working memory and uh, how different brain regions uh, connect with each other. Uh, so how can this work potentially make a difference? Uh, well, for one, uh, uh, I think anybody uh, who's here recognizes the importance of neuroscience research as a, a way to get people to understand these as disorders of, of, uh, of the brain, um, uh, not uh, you know, ill-defined entities. Uh, uh, and specifically in this case, we're looking about a, a disorder of brain development. Uh, we'd like to build a case uh, with this kind of work that schizophrenia is a preventable disorder, uh, and hopefully that something like early folate intervention could have a real impact. Um, the other nice thing about this is that folate fortification, as you may know, is already a part of normal prenatal care. It's just that women don't start taking supplements until uh, they've already found out that they're pregnant in a lot of cases. And we think that potentially earlier uh, uh, beginning of prenatal vitamins, even around the time of conception, might be more likely to have a strong effect. So this is an intervention that's already out there. It's just potentially not being uh, fully, fully used. So we hope that this research will potentially encourage uh, women to start using prenatal vitamins earlier on. And ultimately, of course, we hope that this will make a difference in terms of um, the, the rate of schizophrenia. That's probably more of a distant goal. Um, but really, this work that's being funded by MQ is going to take what we hope is an essential step forward uh, in kind of paving the way for that uh, long-term goal. Uh, so thanks very much. And uh, I'll, uh, I guess we'll have a chance to discuss this in a few minutes after all the speakers.